It is currently Revolutionary War weekend here at Mount Vernon. For the last three years, Mount Vernon has been hosting uh, Revolutionary War reenactors to come and spend a weekend here and they literally they set up tents and they dress up as the soldiers of the time period and basically it's a way to let people kind of get a glimpse into what life literally was like back then. One of the regiments has been really kind enough to let me shadow them today. I will be joining the Continental Army uh, and I will be dressing up. Well you know what it's time for me to get out of these modern day clothes and into some 18th century period costumes so i'll see you guys in a minute all right i've now 18th century fied myself as you can see i've got my track horn hat vest shirt um got some long shorts on let's go uh, find my, my uh, liaison oh. Here now with Marshall, who is the captain of the First Virginia. First Division. First Division. He's going to give me a tour of the camp and kind of explain how everything works. Typically in the 18th century, a camp such as we have here with the various tents up, uh, the the men would be in camp for uh, three days or a little bit longer. And ahead of us, we have rows of tents. These are. EM tents, enlisted men's tents, or to keep it simple, witch tents. But this is what we got. Sorry. So, six people would be in this tiny yes, space. They would be in this tiny space, sleeping this way. That's nuts. They would not be having suitcases. They would just have their haversacks. Okay. And they might be sleeping on their haversacks. They would have that blanket, as I mentioned to you, and that's that's pretty much it. How, how long have you been doing this? I've for? been doing this since uh, 1985 or 86. Wow. And why did you start doing it? Well, usually I think you can find one similarity between everybody who does this type of uh, uh, hobby, as we'll all refer to it. We, we all have a love of history. Uh, my particular period of interest is, is 18th century colonial and um, the American Revolution. And so uh, this is my forte. Okay, so you guys um, just did, you just had lunch and, we did? Yeah. and you cook, did you cook it over there in that fire? Or? We did. Would you like me to show you? Yeah, sure. That'd be awesome. Right. We had soup and we had um, mashed potatoes and we had mac and cheese. So we always have warm water going for um, cooking or for um, washing dishes. Right. So that's just prepping the dishes. Mm -hmm. Somebody's making a bean thing for tonight, I think, in that it's just uh, in the bottom of the pot as beans. So some people are, have been doing this long enough that they know how to, like Stan's really good about finding period correct recipes. He made uh, the soup that he made tonight uh, for today's lunch was period correct. You know, it, it was a stew and he made these little cookie cracker things. That's a 19th century um, recipe. The Sedgwick's tonight, you might want to come back because they did everything, as far as I know. Um, everything that they're doing is period correct. Hey, this, this is this is Allison Sedgwick's daughter. Hi. So they were up until two o'clock yeah, last night making bread. They were um, grinding the wheat, right? And oh yeah, my mom doesn't buy flour. She buys wheat and then grinds it and then we have flour. Yeah. <laughs> and we were um, chopping up uh, stinging nettles because she found a period recipe for stinging nettle soup, which sounds weird. You know what? Can you tell me good. what that is so I don't eat it later? <laughs> <laughs> They don't sting you when you eat them, and they don't really sting you very bad when you hold them, at least the ones that we got. So then why eat it? Because it is a period recipe and she thinks that would be fun. Okay. And she was in charge of preparing the meal. And how long have you guys been doing this for? I've been, this is a year and a half now. How long have you been doing this for? <sighs> Four or five years Oh wow. Ish. It's, it's um, family fun. It's um, historical. I've never been interested in history at, on a personal level until now. Now really? I'm fascinated with it. Now it's like I, you know, I'm, I have much more of an interest in reading books about history and and just because to, to live it is so much more interesting than being in junior high and reading it from a textbook. It's fun. You meet lots of cool people. You learn mm -hmm. so many cool things. The advice that I would give to anybody who's a spectator, if you have any interest, just talk. Walk up to somebody in period clothes and just start asking questions because that's why we're here too. That's one of the jobs that, that we enjoy doing is, is talking to the public and educating people. <laughs> Oh, 
I just walked into the Department of the Geographer's tent and you know the second I walked in I definitely felt like I had been transported into an actual geographer's tent that you would find on the camp in the 18th century. Uh, I'm here with Doug Noble. He is the... I am the lieutenant, lieutenant with the group. In the Department of the Geographers, we are surveyors and map makers to General Washington's army. And when we precede the army, um, laying out maps for the roads so they knew where they could bed down troops, feed livestock, ford rivers, that type of thing. So uh, it was on a need-to-know basis, and uh, we would be in advance of the army by a few weeks. The equipment you see in the room is... a. Uh, the majority of it is is original equipment. Uh, we have pentagraphs for reproducing our maps that we made. Um, we have gutters chains for surveying and uh, circumferters would be our direction finding equipment. Okay. Let's walk outside. We'll take a look at some of the equipment out there. Sure. This is an original piece. It was built by William Collier in 1720 and it's called a circumferter. And this is what the, we would use to actually sight our bearings. So it has horsehair, and horsehair is very, uh, you can see the sight right there. It's very susceptible to humidity, so it's actually kind of wobbled itself out of there. But we would create our sight veins like that. And we take our reading like this. And we line up on the object, and then we could take our field notes off of the bearings that we have uh, recorded here, or displayed there. I got involved with this unit about five years ago. I'm actually one of the newer members to the unit. Um, Mr. Paul Brennan here is actually, he is a surveyor. And he's been with the unit quite a while. I was just fascinated with, uh, with the technology of the era and I was fascinated with the era itself. And um, I, I just enjoy that. Well, and you know, we're quite an eclectic. We very group. much are, yes. They come from all different walks of lives and all different ideas and everything like myself. I began reenacting 20, 25 years ago, and I did the military thing for a while, and then I did a horsey thing for a while, and then as I got older, I got more interested in the social, civic, political thing. So this is a good thing for a civilian, and I'm a retired surveyor in real life, so obviously it's a, my niche to begin with. Sure. So. And what do you do in real life? I'm a pilot. Still? Still, yes. Wow. But I don't look too old to be. No, no, no. I, uh, <laughs> no. I'm just like, what? Well, because you, you do this and you fly planes, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And, and a lot of it uh, correlates. And that, that fascinates me also. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Inside the hospital. And I'm here with Dr. Mike, who is right there, wearing the hat behind me. And Dr. Mike is the head of the hospital here in this tent. What I portray is the senior physician or surgeon of the detached hospital. The detached hospital was a real military unit in the British Army in the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And I talk about the treatment and, of injuries and illnesses and anything else that a soldier, in particular British soldiers, would have gone through. So are you a doctor in real life? No, sir. I am a retired police captain. Okay. Uh, do you like me to show you the material and stuff when I was talking about the bullet wound and such? That's where the ball entered. And you can and see that the material is totally gone. Where it's gone, it's gone into the wound. The and you can see that the blood splatter on the back side. Now, you imagine how dirty this coat would have been after they got it. They got it one a year. So they slept in it, they ate in it, they did everything in it. And this is a piece of bone that was hit by the bullet. When the ball went in, you see how the bone is split. But when it comes out, it tears it all to pieces. If a doctor in the 18th century is confronted with that kind of injury, they've got three problems. The first is you can't put a patient to sleep during this time period for long-term surgery. So any surgery you do is never going to take over 10 minutes, and say the amputation of a limb would take three to five minutes from the first cut when they hit the sawdust on the floor. Doctors of the 18th century also had no concept of germs and bacteria. So if a person, you know, they don't wash their hands before eating, much less wash them before between patients. Also, there is no way to transfuse patients, and this is something a lot of people forget. Any fluid that's lost is lost forever. You can't put fluid back in them. And they won't, you can actually have a person bleed to death before you even get to the hospital. So with those three things working against him, there's nothing that a doctor can do except operate as fast as possible. That's why limb taking off was done so frequently. No matter how dirty that wound is, and no matter how dirty that operation is, it's got to be cleaner than that wound. So it improves the person's chances for survival. I just got back to the base camp, and I'm gonna see if I can get my tent now set up and uh, see where I'm staying for the night. All right, here we go, time for the 
Time for the big reveal. Let's see what it looks like. That's it. You know, it's it's no Ritz Carlton, but you know, I'll take it. I'm good. I'm gonna set up my sleeping bag, and uh, I'm all set up. That's my bed for the night. It's a beautiful evening out here, really is, now that the rain's gone. And I'm gonna go, uh, gonna head out to the jollification, see what that's all about.